Good evening. Good afternoon. Maybe it's good morning for somebody, so <laughs> cover all the bases. <laughs> I think that um, in, in meeting with everybody today, uh, for myself, but also hearing, you know, the other teachers, um, that we all have a sense of you actually doing very well and um, how inspired we are. And we know um, that for a lot of us, it's a huge transition um, to self-retreat really. And uh, the last long one we taught, some people have been saying it was like a warm up <laughs> for this one. Uh, and uh, it's just very inspiring, you know, to sense what it takes to at least change your, your atmosphere at home to a monastery or a nunnery, right? Like you're, you're, sh you're shifting it to um, a place, a sacred space. I know, um, just walking into my home right now, there's a there's a shift in the energy field from holding the space so intensely, and it, it's such a peaceful place. When the my neighbor next door uh, weed wax, he always kind of picks two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, it's Hawaii time, and. Uh, I always think it's funny because it's so hot. I can't imagine why he chooses it like two o'clock. Why not like seven o'clock or eight o'clock? But um, luckily he started at 1.30 and he's gone to the other side of his house. So I'm really very grateful for that. Uh, it's easier for me to concentrate. It's really pretty funny. Um, there are weed whackers in sacred spaces. That's the important part, you know, the sacred space includes everything. Mahasi Sayadaw said that the experience of full enlightenment, of full awakening uh, means that there's no more desire for existence and no more desire for non-existence. And, and I feel like um, it's very important to understand how um, paradoxical that is, but when we're particularly in, in a quiet space, I think we can see the times where we want out, right? And then when we really want in. <laughs> And uh, it's very important to explore these places, you know, no more desire for existence, no more desire for non-existence. And we, we will, I think, often um, be afraid that being free from suffering might mean something like uh, a kind of being obliviated or annihilation, but that isn't what that means. It means the end of greed or craving, the end of aversion, the end of delusion, of confusion. So there, there's no more, the experience, any experience we're having isn't um, referring back to an I or a me or a mine. And I think often we will um, forget that if we are around beings that are more awake, that there is, um, it's say that they don't leave a trace, but there is a vibe. There's a very inspiring vibe, even after they die. 
there's a, a cave up above the monastery in uh, Burma that we go to, the Chazwan Monastery. Uh, and there's um, a history, the story goes, of monks that practice in that cave that became fully enlightened. And I um, always wish for more time to go visit and sit in there. But this, this year, we made it in there for to get to sit for, I think, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And that vibe is so powerful for me. You know, I always kind of just tear up that I have the opportunity to even go in there. So that, that taste of the freedom is still there. This guy's been dead for a long time. And yet, so what is that? There, I had a teacher named Deepama. A lot of you have heard of her. She was from Calcutta. And she was known to be um, third stage of enlightenment. Uh, she had an enormous capacity for developing um, metta, an enormous capacity capacity for developing wisdom. And I remember, um, even though I didn't know she was going to die at that point, I remember the last time I was with her, I sensed something was going to be, I sensed it. Uh, I still tear up when I think of it because I felt like, oh, oh no, <laughs> you know. And um, she knew that I was feeling that way. And she said, oh, don't worry. I'll always be with you. I'm just saying, what is that, right? But I know when I sense her, Every, no matter where I am on the planet, I always feel her in the Northwest in another dimension before she gets fully enlightened. I can feel it. I know she's with me, with us. And when you taste the moments where you have had senses of this real pure metta, or a real pure peace. I think that this is what inspires us to practice, right? It's just like, and, and what, what kind of impact, what kind of power is that? It's like a, it's again that presence of peace, of unconditional love, without conditions, without conditions. The peace is without conditioned, conditioned. The loving kindness is without conditions. There was, uh, in, I think the first year I met Deepama, uh, I was involved in a big decision of whether to move from where I was homesteading in Northern Maine with dear friends and family, um, to move to Massachusetts where Insight Meditation Society was. And it felt like a deep struggle. <laughs> I, went, I went in to talk with her about it and she was just like, would not even engage it. She was just like, the Dhamma is everywhere. That like that, the motivation to move to Massachusetts because of the Dhamma being more there than Northern Maine, forget it. I won't even talk to you about that. <laughs> you know, people have this idea that deep, but Deepa was just always like full of love and, you know, patting you on the back with showers of rain, but she could be hard, man. She could be really hard. It's like, I'm not even gonna talk with you about this. Why? Because it was so true. It's like, there's not even a um, discussion. <laughs> now, I went down to Massachusetts because <laughs> I wanted to be around the Dhamma there, but it's like, 
you know, she drilled it into my head that I could have stayed there and been fine. The Dhamma was there too. And this is, again, the, these beings are not compromising. They're not going to, like, pat you on the back and say, oh, honey, you know, try to, try to not speak the truth to make you feel better. That's not how it is. That's not metta. There's a, a wonderful Hawaiian elder that um, we just found out died in, in Honolulu, Nainoa Thompson's mother. Nainoa Thompson, um, if you don't know who he is, was a, uh, is a great, uh, one of the great navigators who brought the Polynesian navigating back. Um, And there's, there's a lot to be said about all that. And um, I won't go into it today, but his mother wasn't that well known. And she was like the whole, to me, she was the being that held the whole process. And I didn't know her that well. And every time I, was with her because Steve's family uh, knew knew Nainoa's family very well. And whenever I was around her, I could see her incredible uh, metta, just uh, so developed, so so pure. She welcomed anybody, everybody, children. You know, um, took care of so many people. She worked so hard taking care of so many people. I can't even imagine it. Um, and one time I was over on the big island um, after some years of working to even buy the land that Vipassana Hawaii has now in um, the north of this island. Um, we hit a very difficult place where the economy had fell and people in the mainland really couldn't grasp that, that, that things in Hawaii could take this long. <laughs> it's like, it's a very different world here, very, very different time scale and getting anything done. It's like we, someone donated to, to, for us to drill a well and three years later, we're still working at it. We, we keep thinking it's almost going to be done. You know, it will be. I don't know. We could take bets on if it will be at the end of this year if we have water. But, you know, it just takes time, you know. And um, it's taught me so much about sort of my Boston, Massachusetts conditioning that you, you know, you just get it done, you know. And here it's so different. And what matters here is the love of the land. It has nothing to do with buildings. There is, there is a valuing and a valuing of who loves the land and who takes care of it and who really takes care of it, not theoretical. Um, and I, I know that. I moved here in 83. I have that sense and I have that sense of where I love where I grew up, the land and lake I grew up on. It's very deep in me. But I just thought, wow, I don't, I think it was maybe, well, at least 10 years we were working at it, but um, it was feeling like, oh, this is getting so hard. I don't know if I can do this. And I went to see Laura Thompson, this elder that just died in the back of the valley that Steve grew up in. and. Um, I just brought her a white pineapple, and that's a very valued uh, gift here. And she was so happy. And I just started crying at a certain point. I was like, I don't think I can keep at this. I said, the, the friends I have and students and <laughs> the rest of the world can't understand how this can take so long. Here it is 2020, right? This is probably 2008. <laughs> and, and she just hugged me and hugged me, and she's like, Oh, honey, she's like, you have to give, you have to take this every hundred years. I 
I don't see you all really the impact of that, but that is Hawaiian time. That is Polynesian time. That is not Massachusetts time that I grew up with. But boy, I got to say in like one moment, I was like, oh, right, okay, every hundred years. No problem. What was wrong with me? Why was I in such a hurry? Okay, this is leading to our practice. And how we practice every day and every moment. Because when we're trying to get somewhere, and when we're trying to hurry, we're out of the uh, timeless world. The timeless world is always here. It's always something to fall back on, to lean into. And when we're in hurry, we're caught, we're pr imprisoned. It's a kind of deep suffering. I have um, never been home in um, Hawaii this time of year. I've always been on the road teaching for a big chunk of time this time of year. Uh, and I um, often orient where I am um, to the stars. So I have an orientation here where I live um, at the time sworn I'm here. And it's a very set schedule. You know, it's like year after year, it's a kind of a set schedule. Some things have changed, but um, for the pandemic, it's totally different. So all, all summer, I've been really getting to know the constellation Scorpio and Sagittarius and Jupiter and Saturn are there. Um, and I've never been here or anywhere where I've seen these summer stars. Actually, I must be in forests, you know, teaching or something. But uh, it's been so moving to me because uh, the Sagittarius is said to be a teapot. So I'm, I'm always feeling like I'm having a tea party with Jupiter and Saturn. And then the Scorpio to me looks like a big kite. And it's really um, lovely when I see them or when the constellations actually disappear and I just see dark and light. Yeah, you can, you can be with the stars long enough and you don't see the pattern. It, it, it's like practice. You, you kind of move through concept, right? You move through concept to non-conceptual sky. So this, this morning I woke up at um, 4 a.m. and looked out and the winter stars were there. The uh, Pleiades, Orion, Taurus, <laughs> the big dog. I was so shocked. I just, I can't tell you. It was like, what happened? You know, it's like, <laughs> where, where did summer go? It's like winter stars are up already. It was like such a great moment of, oh, it's moving so fast. You know, it's like if you live in the north, the, the buds are already formed for next year. If you look carefully, everything up there is already re ready for winter. So it's just, we tend to um, not pay attention as closely and on retreat we get to, but that sense of things as uh, Jesse and Steve have been talking about, that sense of impermanence and how quickly things are moving. You know, the great goose showing like, you know, basically you couldn't even see him, the bell just rang when he flew up. When we um, practice, often one, in, one instruction is to see if we can be with the beginning, middle, and end of things, like the beginning, middle, end of a step, beginning, middle, of the end of a breath, or beginning, middle, end of a sound. And sometimes as you start to pay attention, you'll see that you can observe that, but sometimes we only see the middle. And sometimes we only see the end. And sometimes we only see endings. And we, we realize, wow, anything ap that appears is also vanishing at the same time. 
that's one aspect of reality. So you're, we're not saying that's the only way that it is. We're saying that that's, a, that's often getting closer to the unconditioned and that deeper uh, awareness. But when you're experiencing things like that, you tend to feel like you're on the surface. So that if you notice a thought, um, you probably don't notice most of the time the beginning, middle, end. It's gone so quick you notice it as a memory. But it's rare that we see the beginning, middle, end of a thought. It's why it's so easy to get lost in them. Because, why? Because they're moving so quickly. On this island in Hawaii, there is the uh, largest mountain in the world. It's called Mauna Loa, Loa. And um, when you see it from a distance, or when I see it from a distance, it's so um, inspiring to me. It's so sublime. It's so new. It, it's so perfectly shaped practically. It's just um, beautiful. But once a year, I try to, <laughs> not usually make it, but try to make a pilgrimage. There's a road up to 11,000 feet, and there's very few people out there, or very few, you see very few cars. There's actually a, a place where people um, who, are pract who practice going to Mars, so there's a place up there, I think it might be around 10,000 feet, that you don't, you're not allowed into that part, but that they're there. And then there's a little weather station, but there's not much up there happening um, in terms of humans. When, when you get up there and you get out of the car, all you see are pebbles. Like from the distance, you see this like unbelievably powerful mountain and it's pristine and sublime. But then you step out of the car. But I'm saying like miles and miles of this, like this is the biggest mountain in the world. And basically it's all like little red and black pebbles. And there's something so um, mind-stopping about it, at least for me. I can't quite wrap my head around that there's this um, mountain that will vanish. It's just pebble. And yet it seems so solid. It's like the earth, you know. Um, we have this idea that things are so solid and so dependable. But the Buddha taught, and we know from our own observation, that anything that takes birth will disappear. Anything. That's, that's the first um, truth of existence. So the, the, the intent of Vipassana is very specific. It's very direct. It's, it's meant to help us understand the three characteristics of existence that we all share, mountains, gods and goddesses, stars, um, pebbles, fish, humans, you know, all beings, frogs, all beings, every being, everything that takes birth will pass away, that we all share. And this is what's so important for us, that this connects us all. If you connect with the breath of your cat, you connect with all beings breathing, or guinea pig, or dog, or tree in your yard. We're all breathing. You know, we, we know that the moon affects us so deeply. There's a great teacher from India, Srinazar Gadada Maharaj, that said, the stars affect us, and we affect them deeply. That's how connected we are. So the understanding of anicca, of impermanence, means that we start to take in that there is, because everything that takes birth vanishes, that there's nothing worth holding on to. 
that because you can't, you can't hold on to something that vanishes. So it's not worth vanishing. But it doesn't mean that life doesn't matter and that we don't take great care of it, that it's precious. And, and I think this is what humans have such a hard time with is the paradox of that, that the, the deeper you understand Anicca, the deeper you will care, the deeper you get how precious life is. I have three feral cats and the mother came when she was starving. She starved for months, had these babies I didn't even know about. Um, and she's very fragile. And her daughters are actually much healthier. So she gets to sleep in the garage at night. Like, you know, I'm allergic. She, she's in the garage. At, she's a little nightlight. And, um, but when I go in there, I know she's almost 10 years old and she's feral. And I don't know how long she will live. She could live longer, but she might not. She's, she really had a hard early life. And um, we'll see. But I, I'm very aware of that, of her fragility, but also um, the gift of her and the unknown of how long she'll be here, right? That there's that paradox that we all hold. Does that mean that, that she's fragile, that I don't care about her, that it doesn't matter? And I think we have to really um, understand that um, trajectory, that, that um, it's like life is a pilgrimage and to understand that sometimes we're needing uh, the love side and the metta side and just that we do, we're just not really up for an each other, you know, <laughs> we're not up for facing impermanence and that that's okay, that we need that reassurance, we need that support and that could last years, that's okay. And other, other people might be leaning into the wisdom side and the metta just doesn't call them or the Brahma Viharas and that's okay. We need to be able to um, kind of lean into where we're called and to trust that that's just where we need to be. Do a lot to do here. Uh, a number of people today mentioned pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. The the second foundation of mindfulness, Vedana. So just the reminder of the um, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral is a mental feeling. It's not a physical feeling. It's actually happening in the mind door of the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. The mind is having the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral is happening here in the mind. So um, hearing, seeing, Tasting, smelling, touching, body, mind, thinking, emotion, um, with each moment of consciousness, with each moment of hearing or thinking or smelling, tasting, there's a corresponding simultaneous pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral mental feeling. And when we start delving into the truths of existence and Anicca, this is um, totally unpredictable. <laughs> two seconds ago there might have been a thought it was pleasant then there might be a neutral body sensation the next thought could be unpleasant the next sound could be unpleasant the next sound could be pleasant you, I'm trying I can't ever say it as fast as it happens now when we talk about being born into a world of change this is Vedana is it it's like to just pay attention to Vedana sometimes is really important because the Buddha said this is where you can break the stickiness. This is where we break the chain of where we're oppressed. It's that um, lack of understanding this is why we suffer. The lack of understanding that this is what we're born into that we suffer. Because if we're not aware 
that we're afraid of something or pushing away something, irritated by something, resisting something because it's unpleasant, then we're not, we're not free. Or if we're holding on to something pleasant because it's past, a pleasant sitting two days ago or five years ago or this morning, um, we, we don't understand why we're suffering. Or if something's neutral, often for most humans, the neutral is the most scary because it, it's like lacks intensity. There's less to hold on to. The mind tends to shift into boredom or, or indifference, not caring, passivity. So this world of change, this truth of existence, it starts to shift into that dukkha aspect of truth uh, because it's, it's like we never know what's going to happen. And, and I just want to remind us all, that's something we all share, all of us, all beings on the planet. If we're connected with impermanence, we're safe and protected. If we're connected with unpredictability, we're safe and protected. We're not surprised. We're not reacting to it. So the aversion or attachment delusion are a form of identification. It's like my fear, my thought, my knee pain, right? Um, my attachment, my sleepiness. And if you see when, when we're starting to push something away with, with just a light annoyance, it's like we, it's because we can't bear the unpleasant. And, but often we don't even know it. We don't realize it if we just said, oh, this is just unpleasant. It's okay. It shifts things. Or if something, if we're holding on to something like um, a clear sitting, <laughs> for example, you know, it's like, we don't even know it's, we're holding on to it because it was pleasant or what we want. We might, it might be equanimity, which includes pleasant, un, unpleasant and neutral, but we're, we're not aware that we're holding on to it. And so we shift back into, oh, that clarity was pleasant. Or I liked it. I want it back. The wanting. We can't bear that it passed. And with the neutral, um, often again, it's like we can't bear the neutrality. It's not intense enough for us. It's not holding our attention. And it leads to confusion, boredom. And to remember, you know, we've been talking about this already, but to remember that the aversion, attachment, delusion, they're, um, they're an attempt to protect us from this change, from this unpredictability. If, it, if the train is going by and uh, <laughs> it's like, and the pleasant has already passed, you know, we want to hold on to the train and make it stop. But, but we're already out of harmony with the truth. The pleasure did pass. That's the truth. Or like something unpleasant happens and we want the pleasant back. It's like we're all caught up in, oh, it's so painful. But actually, if we just was a, were able to say, oh, it's just painful, it's okay. Or then I'm going to get into it. It's like the, the, the shift that we mostly are needing to do is say, oh, um, I'm, I'm craving this pleasure. It's not just like, oh, it's just pleasant, but craving has happened. Or with the unpleasant, that aversion or fear has happened. It's like we, we haven't accepted that the, that the shift from unpleasant to annoying to irritation to aversion has happened. This is, this is the next few days we get to explore this. We get to explore what is identification. And instead of going, no, identification is bad or wrong, it's more like to explore the mind moving or chasing or, or um, holding. It's like, oh, it's such a relief to go, ah, oh, ha, 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 holding on to pleasure and to make that the object of the attention. Ah, oh, ha, 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 aversion to aversion. 
disliking, disliking. And people who practice a long time, this can get very, very subtle. This can be a long time where there's no aversion to anything and we're just flowing with a sixth sense door experience and one, one teeny little thought comes and we're having aversion, not to the content, but that a thought even happened. It's, it, whether it's aversion to knee pain or having a thought, it's the same thing. If you're holding on to a piece of chocolate, it's the same as holding on to a good sitting. And there's, I think that some, some of you have tell, told me there's a weariness with that. When you start seeing this clearly, that you get weary of it. And that's good. You get weary of having aversion to thinking, weary of being attached to clear, clear um, practice. Weary of aversion to sleepiness. This is really good practice, but you have to do it long enough to get to that weariness of just like yearning and longing for freedom, to value that weariness, and to, it's the best. It's the best practice is when we get sick of it. Sick of being chained to experience. But not sick enough. <laughs> That's what I always joke with myself. <laughs> I'm not sick enough right now. <laughs> you have to have humor with this, right? It's just like, ha, 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 ha. You know, not able to totally let it all be at this moment in time. But maybe five minutes from now, in an hour, no hurry. Just like time to get up, go for a walk, take a break. Don't get too serious. The less we're identified, say with fear, the more it feels like mine, or we're triggered and we're just so caught in the story and all involved. That's not bad or wrong, but but it's tasting as that identification with it dissipates and we see how exhausting the feeling of it, of being mine is. But I'm not saying make that a problem. I'm saying when you're really tied or caught with something, taste it, feel it, get to know it. Have compassion for it. Like it's like, oh, you know, I, you know, you know me, I joke a lot about E.T. when he just points to his heart and he's like, ow, ow, it hurts to be, it hurts to be so identified. <laughs> Let's change the channel one time. Okay. Anyway. Okay. I think it was about five years ago, I'm not sure, but I was uh, flying out of Vancouver after teaching a weekend retreat. And it might have been two week retreat after that, very tired. Flew to Chicago on my way to Massachusetts to teach. Um, and you know, long way over in Chicago, got a, was getting up on the, um, to the plane and there was a line of us. It was very crowded late at night getting into <laughs> to line. And this priest was walking the other way, trying to get, you know, toward the bathrooms rather than into the plane. And he was looking around and he made eye contact with me and he, I knew that I was the person. He had found the person. And so I'm like, oh no. And he's coming toward me. I'm like, oh no, no, no. And he's like, there's a guy back there. 
in the in the plane and I can't do it. I can't do it. He was like, I can't help him. I am too tired. I'm like, well, I'm tired. <laughs> and he said, he's terrified. He's having a panic attack. You got to help him. And I'm like, actually, can I say no? And he's like, no, you've got to go do it. So he talked to the stewardess and he we switched seats. And I'm like sitting next to this guy. And it's like, I sit down, I'm like, what's the problem? And he's like, well, I uh, never fly in planes. I can't, I have a phobia. This is like, I don't think I can do this. He's sweating. He's like clenching his teeth. He's like, um, I'm like, well, why don't we get off the plane? You know, why don't we just like end this now? And he's like, no, 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 I have to do it. There's an emergency. I have to do it. He said, I, I actually drove out to Chicago to do this thing and I was going to um, drive back. But so um, I'm like, okay, okay. So um, he starts reading you know those little plastic sheets that tell you what to do if the plane crashes? I'm like, what are you doing? And I said, he's like, I'm reading what to do if the plane crashes. I'm like, no, we're not, this is like not, not going to be helpful. And he's like, he's reading it. He insists on reading it. He's even more terrified. So I'm going to change the story for a second. Many years ago, I had a student with Lou Gehrig's disease. Most of you know, that's a very hard karma. Um, and I had known her before it got bad. And so um, we worked for years on this one way to practice with the fear of not being able to breathe. And so it was really a wonderful teaching for both of us. And I've shared it with many people that when she would start getting really afraid, and that got more intense, you know, when she was in a wheelchair and she needed oxygen sometimes. And we would practice, am I okay right now? Am I okay right now? And she would always say 99% of the time when I asked myself that question, I'm okay. And I do that a lot. Like, maybe I'm not afraid, but it's just like with so much that's going on when fear arises it's just like oh but am, are we are a lot of us okay right now am i okay right now and that it's a kind of meta but there's wisdom it's like really bringing both together and having that deep reassurance and it's very helpful very valuable so i thought well i'll share this with this guy right <laughs> So I told him about this and he was really in, into it. And, you know, we're practicing, am I okay right now? And the plane takes off and we, we're, it's, we're doing great. And then um, he, he knocks on my shoulder. I'm trying to like meditate and he's like, it's not working anymore. And he's like going into a huge pain. And I, I stood up and I'm like, well, of course it's going to work. It always works. <laughs> I got mad at him. Like, why, why isn't it working? Like, this works for all of everybody. Like, why isn't it working? He's like, Michelle is not working. I can't, you know, he's freaking out. And I sit down. I'm like, okay. No wonder the priest, <laughs> no wonder the priest left. And so uh, I'm like, I take a few breaths and I have to switch totally. And I said, oh, I said, what's going to happen when you land at the airport? And I said, oh, I, I, he's like freaking out. I'm too afraid, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, who's going to meet you? Let's go into the future. Who's going to meet you? And he said, well, my wife and daughter are going to meet me. And I said, great. Do you love them? And do they love you? And he said, yes. And he started crying. And I said, well, that's what we're going to do for the rest of the flight. So we just walked through it over and over and over. The plane landed. We walked together, baggage together, like his, his wife and daughter came and he looked in their eyes and all this met in love and that worked. I'm not saying we had a break between doing it. It, 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 he needed this so bad, but it's like, am I okay right now? Work for a while, but you see, this is how life is, right? Something will work for a while and then, Maybe we need all meta, right? And we actually had to go into the future, right? And so it wasn't, am I okay right now? It's like, I'm going to be okay 
when I get there and I see my wife and child, right? That's, and so be careful of having ideas about how it should be. The best part of this is that when we got to baggage, the priest came over to me and took me aside and said, I didn't think that guy was going to make it. <laughs> I said, well, thanks a lot. We joked, but it was like he was, he was burnt out. He was too tired. But it was just that feeling of um, we all get triggered. And it might not be fear of mine, but every human being has at least one thing that's like a joke we usually have a number of things that trigger us and this is something to explore on retreat that like when you're calm when things are going easily and and that's like we tend to call that you know the purity purification teaching the purity is when mindfulness and maybe metta are the seven factors of enlightenment some of them are there or one calm concentration joyful interest something is there and we're able to do the practice in the formal way or not formal but we feel um, that this is good practice the only issue is that it's this is my good practice or that this is how everything should be all the time practice of course we want purity to be happening. Of course we want the factors of enlightenment to be happening. Of course we want to be protected from the hindrances. Of course we, and, and we practice for that and it's important. But also what we tend to forget is that this is called the path of purification. And that we're meant to be also uh, practicing, connecting with, aversion and connecting with attachment connecting with the delusion sleepiness restlessness doubt we're we're meant to be getting more and more practice with it we're, we're cultivating a relationship of practice of west wisdom in a brahma vihara with um, the difficulties why because freedom isn't getting rid of anything free so if we think we got rid of attachment and attachment comes up two years later or two seconds later that isn't freedom that's aversion and that you know my actually my body taught me this that i have a low back pain karma since 1979 and in my early years of practice sometimes it went away maybe two or three years and then <laughs> I remember the first time it came back and I was like I thought I got rid of you right that isn't freedom and that's what taught me all about this aspect of freedom it's like no I don't have a very good relationship with this do I I certainly have more practice with it more and more practice the best thing is that the Buddha had a bad back. It's a certain kind of karma that lasts through your lifetime. So we tend to, tend to, we can't help it, we're human. We tend to think, I'm just, if I just can get rid of the shame, then I'll be enlightened. If I can just get rid of the sleepiness, if I can just get rid of these repetitive thinking patterns, then I'll be okay. It isn't, that isn't it. If you're a fear type, you think you should get rid of the fear. If you're aversive, you think you should get rid of aversive type. If you're a greedy type, you think you have to get rid of it. You can't bear it. That's the nature of it. If you're the deluded type, wow, confusion. There's a great movie where one of the characters says, if you're not confused, you don't know what's going on. That's great for deluded types. It's great for all of us, but it's just like to remember confusion's okay. Confusion's okay, aversion's okay, attachment's okay. But we don't wanna be imprisoned by it. We don't wanna be acting from it we don't want to be drowning in it 
right? We want to see it clearly and be able to go, oh, my good friend of version, I know how to experience you. Usually, of course, we drop into the body, the physical sensations, notice the thoughts coming and going, and then remember, oh, this is, this is coming up because something was unpleasant and I couldn't deal with it. It's attachment, craving, oh, something was so pleasant and I want it back, wanting. It's just wanting, it's okay. But we pull back from the object of the wanting and feel the pain of it in the heart. And it's just a contraction, a contraction, just like tightness in the body is something hard to be with, but we can learn to, that it's just tight. Well, aversion, attachment, and delusion are just a tightening of the mind. It's just a contraction. It's not a big deal when you see it clearly. What I love about this practice is that no matter how, how long we've been caught, you know, no matter how much we're dragging ourselves along with some difficulty, that we can begin again. And that something clears, you know, somehow the mindfulness comes back. The more you're mindful, the more you'll be mindful. And uh, some karmas are more difficult than others, but it's just being triggered. And resistance, if resistance is happening, we respect it. This is what Steve's been saying, Jesse's saying, Darina's saying, I am saying. It's like resistance can either be torture or arrest. If you go, oh, my good friend, resistance, I was hoping you'd come up right now, meaning we're not able to accept what's happening unconditionally. There's conditional going on and it's painful, then we ask ourselves, can I be with the resistance with mindfulness or metta or compassion? If the answer is no, it's not a problem. You just change the object of the awareness. It's not personal. And that's the rest. The rest is that you have something else to pay attention to, sounds, go for a walk, have a cup of tea. Or stand up if you're sitting. Sometimes you just stand up. Sometimes you just be with a breath or hand. Or do some metta, compassion, equanimity, mudita. You can always start again. This is from Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. Once you realize that all comes from within, that the world in which you live has not been projected onto you, but by you, your fear comes to an end. Without this realization, you identify yourself with the externals, like the body, like the mind, like society, nation, humanity, even God, or the absolute. But these are all escapes from fear. It is only when you fully accept your responsibility for the little world in which you live and watch the process of its creation, preservation, and destruction that you will be free from your imaginary bondage. The prison is imaginary. Let's sit for a minute.
Well, sweet dreams for those of you who are going to bed now and have a good evening for those of you early evening and for those of us who have a little more of the day and evening. Um, lucky us. <laughs>